Hello everyone, uh, I'm Joe Stoner, I'm the uh, president of Marymount Preservation Foundation. And tonight uh, we want to help preserve the memory and work of Nancy Ford Cummings, at, uh, beginning of the 20th century. She was right up there with Stieglitz and Steichen, if you know who they are. She was in an in a international competition and uh, Steichen won first, Cummings won second, and now with Stieglitz who was very famous. Uh, was, was third. And um, so she lived in Marymount for a year, 1926. She was helped, she was asked to be here to help promote it because the lots weren't selling as well as they are. So the Marymount Company invited her because she was world famous and she lived right next door in Loveland. So they gave her a house here in Okinawa. Uh, in 1926, I stayed here for a year and uh, photographed it. And I want to thank everyone for coming to this beautiful place, the Women's Art Cultural Center, also known as the Barn. Uh, it was uh, a massive rehab project, and it was, it was done by women. Barn, uh, then it was a maintenance barn, and then when they built a new maintenance barn, the village couldn't see any use for it, they were going to tear it down. But a woman, Jane McDonald, uh, took it herself to restore this, and she did. And uh, it's beautiful and certainly is an asset to Marymount. Uh, this is a photo focus event. It's a biennial. It happens every two years in Cincinnati. And this is just one of the venues. And uh, the MPF wants to thank Lynn Long for working so hard. Uh, they created <laughs> called Reinterpreting uh, Nancy Ford Combs. And I hope you've had a chance to walk around and see the original Nancy Ford Combs photographs and the smartphone uh, interpretations. Most of these are from Dr. Egbert's, uh, the originals from Dr. Egbert's collection, who will be give the, the speech tonight. Tonight's lecture, um, and we think that was a, was a great idea to come up with this reinterpretation thing. Uh, tonight's lecture by Dr. Ren Egbert is as part of a series of Millard F. Rogers lectures sponsored by the Preservation Foundation uh, to raise the awareness of Marymount's unique heritage. And I want to especially thank Nina Rogers, Lauren <laughs> for generously sponsoring this over the years. And she helps make it possible. So I want to give her a special thanks. If you see her, She's wearing a corsage. I think she's the only one. <laughs> Thank her in person. Tonight's lecture is particularly appropriate for this series because when Miller was the director of the Cincinnati Art Museum, he created the first curator of photography position. And uh, is there anybody here from the Art Museum? I know we invited some. <laughs> Anyway, he he uh, created that, that position there. He was also the president of the Marymount Preservation Foundation. He worked with another trustee, Len Weekly, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, and uh, to acquire our collection uh, from the Walt Burton Gallery. Len has generously agreed to subsidize the. Uh, mounting and matting of uh, these are most of these original photos. And he also has some prints back there for sale with the proceeds going towards the barn. So there are four uh, and support cone prints available. Uh, so that's about all I have to say. Um, like I said I would now like to introduce the director of the barn and the curator of the show and uh, the brains behind this operation, Lynn Wall. I'm 
so excited to see so many people in the audience tonight. We're not really sure what kind of an audience we're going to get. It's very gratifying. Um, the barn is very thrilled to participate in this year's Photo Focus Biennial. It's a region-wide photography exhibit dedicated to the art of photography during the month of October. Um, we should still have some pamphlets that show the big map and the 60-some venues that you can hit with, with uh, photographic art for you to check out this month by the front door. Um, the exhibit on the walls, uh, the genesis of the idea came from Jan Boone, who thought a community component would be neat. Um, so we actually ran a Facebook contest for people to look at the Nancy Port Cones photos that we put on a Facebook page and to uh, respond with their uh, smartphone image. So this is where the parrot exhibit comes from. Um, some of the photographs are on loan from Marymount Preservation Foundation. Um, some are from Len Weekly's collection. Um, when PhotoFocus realized that we were going to focus on Nancy Ford Cones, they connected us with Dr. Ren Egbert, who loaned from his collection a significant portion of the photographs by Nancy Ford Cones on display today. While working on his master's in art history, Ren was introduced to Margaret Cones. She was the only child of James and Nancy Combs and still lived in the family home in Loveland, Ohio. Her mother, Nancy Ford Combs, placed second in a national photography competition in New York City in 1905. I know Joe mentioned this. Um, Margaret had perfectly preserved all of the photographs, awards, and the documentation of her parents' photographic career. During Wynn's talk, he will acquaint you with their journey and amazing photography. It is a heartwarming story of a couple dedicated to their art and family. And now I'm going to hand the show over to Ren. Thank you. If I'm too loud, please let me know. I'll adjust the mic. Um, this is a real pleasure for me because I'm a huge fan of Nancy Ford Cones. So uh, I'm a collector at heart and have been collecting to my wife's trip in for many years and uh, photography is my main interest and um, I'm going to share my story regarding Nancy and uh, we got that off. Did you get that off? Anybody? You just click it. <laughs> Thanks Chris. This is my, my ace number one man who helped me put this show together, Chris Hogan. So I want to thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. So, the first thing I want to share with you, this is Nancy Ford Collins, her name. James Seinfeld. So, it's interesting because this is the, the collaboration they had. James was never really ever present. Nobody talked about James Collins, nobody put his name on photographs. But he did all the darkroom work. He was a photographer in his own right. And his signature and handwriting was much better than Nancy's. <laughs> so he signed it. The images that you see that are hand signed around here was all done by James. So um, I thought that was why I had this up first. I thought it was kind of an image uh, that really spoke to a, um, a partnership, but a silent partner. And we'll speak more of that as we go forward in the night. Um, so I kind of organized my talk around the idea of what were contemporaries saying about her, what were people who, uh, when she was rediscovered in the 80s and the early late 70s and 80s, what were they saying about her? I didn't want this to be just my opinion about what I see about Nancy. I wanted to see, have you seen her and James through the eyes of other people? So I arranged my talk through a number of quotations. And um, so we're going we're gonna to take a, a journey through their life and talk about that. Now, obviously, hopefully, a lot of you had a chance to see the biography. I'm going to highlight a few things, but not in the same detail as we have up here. So um, let's go to the next slide. All right. So um, the story starts in 1977. And um, in January of 1977, I went to Mount Adams to see a show of Ansel Adams that Walt Burton had in the studio. Um, that just, it had just burst onto the scene, Ansel was big, and I said, I gotta go see these photographs. So I went up 
to that show, fell in love with Ansel, and I purchased my first photograph. That was 1977 in January. So as the story unfolds, of course, Margaret went to the same show. So Margaret, while reading in the paper, there was a photograph that Ansel had taken of Stieglitz in his, in his studio. And she saw the name Stieglitz. Click. You know, my mom competed against Stieglitz. So she went to the show. Now, she didn't get to meet Walt the first time, but she met um, um, Tom Warman, who was there. And so that segued all the way to the point where Walt went out and visited Margaret. So I didn't know Walt at the time. I started to become friends with Walt. I was working on my master's in art history at the University of Cincinnati. And as this began to unfold, it became clear to me that she was my thesis topic. And that, <laughs> because I didn't have anything else to write about. And I loved photography and I thought, wow, this woman's been undiscovered. And, uh, so what a great idea. And, I, and then, of course, it was just only logical that I would go in and go through the estate and, and put the information that you see up here was all things that I've put together. So I had the privilege of being with Margaret in the home and going through all the documents, all the stacks of magazines, all the albums, all the um, awards that she had gotten, all the photographs on the walls, the glass slides, everything. It was very magical. So in 1977, then, Ansel Adams, in one sense, was really rediscovered. In 1977, Margaret, or Nancy Ford Combs was rediscovered. Also, it was the beginning and the heyday of photography as an art form. So the prices went up, famous artists came out, and there was exhibitions, and so it was just a rebirth, a rediscovery of a lot of things. And for me, it was discovering my passion, which is collecting photography, um, and working with Margaret and Waltz and going through that whole estate and just having the joy of seeing these images and being able to contribute to the knowledge of what we know about Nancy today. So that, that was significant for me. So I um, also wanted to share with you um, a little bit about my visit to the home, but not, not the home, her home. Um, I, there's an article back here by um, James Scott. So I like to add other people's opinions in here. So let me turn this on. So let me try to read this. Right. So this is when he went out to the house. The house had an eerie kind of Miss Haversham look to it. Memories everywhere were left intact. Margaret's father died in 1939, but his hat was still hanging in the hall. Hardly anything, in fact, had been changed since her parents had moved into the large red brick farmhouse in 1905. When um, Walt's assistant asked to use the bathroom. Margaret handed her a lantern and pointed her out the back door. Um, when I went out there, there was no running water. Um, it was it was just amazing. It was just really walking back in time, and 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 it was just like a shrine, you know. So it was really quite amazing, and um, and and that began that journey. So um, this was a photograph taken by. A John Schmidt, who was the photographer of the Cincinnati Post. This was taken in 1923 on the 23rd anniversary of their marriage. And uh, it's taken on their road that's in front of their house. So they lived on a small road that, that went out of Loveland that was right on the little Miami River. So let me share a little bit about them and their story. Um, so James was born in 19, um, or 1861. Um, he was in Kentucky. He moved around a bit. He ended up graduating from Lebanon High School with an arts degree. Um, he um, moved to Cincinnati for a bit. He got a camera, started taking some photographs, moved back to Lebanon, and he purchased a portable photographic studio. So one that you would hook onto the horse and you'd take it around and you go around an itinerant for photographer. Um, in, um, in 1869, Nancy was born in Milan, Ohio, middle of five children. Her father was a physician. They divorced, which was pretty unusual back then. 
the father had the custody of all the children. I don't know if that was because he had more money or what, but the mother moved and I don't, I don't know that she would have ever had anything more to do with her. Nancy met James in Lebanon in 1894. That was a brief meeting. Nancy then moved with her family to Fostoria. Um, he bought Nancy and they sent her to school to do some, to learn how to retouch photography, photographs. So either hand coloring or just retouching something that needed some work, maybe had some stains on it or something. And then um, in 1897, her father purchased her a part interest in a studio. And um, that lasted for a short bit, but basically, uh, the, her partner was not very scrupulous, and uh, she severed that relationship and moved back to Lebanon to be with her sister who was nursing. Um, I think her husband wasn't doing well. So she returned to Lebanon, that was 1898. She was still taking photographs, she had learned the techniques and was doing that, and she, uh, she happened to take some photographs and he had them developed and there was no place to go. So she saw James his, uh, his portable studio though, and she went up to James and said, would you develop this film for me and, and print it? And he said he'd love to do that. It was 10 cents. She shoved for two nickels. He said, no, thank you. I, I'll do it for, for nothing. And she insisted, so he took the two nickels, and a couple weeks later, Nancy goes back to the, to the studio, retrieves her photographs, and James has two beautiful nickel cufflinks. Oh, on his shirt. <laughs> the story continues. <laughs> and they uh, marry in 1900 in South Lebanon. They moved into a studio in Xenia for a little bit, and then they moved to Covington. So let's look at Covington here. So Covington, in Covington, James' cousin had a studio. This is the advertisement for Nancy's um, studio in 19, well this is a 1902 advertisement, they moved there in 1900 or 1901. Um, so they, this is right on Madison Street in Covington. They lived, the studio was on the second floor and they lived on the third floor. Um, this is one of the ads. They also did ads celebrating the fact that they really did children well and they would, you know, they had really good portraiture of kids, and I thought this was really great because it seems the way, you know, uh, under the recognition of your friendly eye, it seems fairly to take life. I also like the fact that this is photography as a fine art. So, you know, that that's a little bit novel. She also calls herself a pictorialist, which we'll talk about later in the, as we go through the, that. Um, they didn't have a car or anything back then, of course, so obviously when they did appointments, they got the horse and buggy out and went out and did portraits. Um, so, in um, also the same year, Henry Farney came to visit and asked to have his portrait done. So, I don't know if this was her first big time client, I'm not sure. Um, it's also said that she photographed President Taft and his wife, and maybe it's part of the family. I have not seen any images from that, and I'm not, never have really checked into that as far as the, uh, um, to see if the Taft Museum has anything like that. But so, uh, the story is Henry just came in and said, hey, I need my portrait taken. Um, at this time, Nancy was gaining a, a, a wonderful reputation as a, a wonderful portraitist. And um, looking at this, I mean, he meets your eyes. I love the light as it comes in. It's just really a nice portrait. Uh, and this is some of the images that we've seen used in other funny um, photographs. So in 1902, um, they also started working with Kodak. Um, so one of the main sources for income for them was selling photographs to Kodak for advertising. So they, over the years, they their, their primary interest in Cincinnati was doing portraiture, doing children, doing families. They had clients in Glendale. A lot of the UC professors um, were clients. There were clients all over town that would come in, and, and especially a lot of the children and young children, and especially young children. I have a lot of those in my collection, and none of them were on the walls, but um, it was in, most of them don't have any names, so I don't know who, were, who was doing it. Um, also, then in, um, 
1905, Margaret was born. Also in 1905, they bought the farm in Lovell. Uh, they didn't move there until 1907. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about all of that a little bit more. I want to go into, this is Professor Daniel Cook. Daniel Cook was a professor of applied arts at the University of Cincinnati in the 20s. Um, he was an author. He would write articles on photography. He had written a handbook on photography. He taught at some of the institutions or some of the camera clubs around. And um, I liked what he had to say about the gun bichromate. This is the primary process that they used, that James used. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, it's basically one that lends itself to manipulation and to adding color. It lends itself to a painterly image to a softness. Um, the dryad over there is a gum. There's quite a few gums. The little young lady with the kitten is a, is a, is a gum. Mr. McCobber in the back is a, is a gum. So, um, this is wrestling. So this is a gum. I want you to notice the fireplace because you're going to see it again. In the back was a small house or small building. Um, they use that a lot for photographic taking. Um, and this played central in um, the, a lot of the photographs they had. I love the light. I love the outline of his face captured by the light. Uh, very reminiscent of what you see in the Dutch painters or Rembrandt prints and things like that where you see the light coming from a single source and creating a lot of shadows, and lights and darks. This is the gum bichromate. So it's a light the bichromate is light sensitive agent, just like silver would be in a silver gel print. The gum is the support. Single print can be made with a wide range of colors. And there are several in the she took greens and blues and purples and all sorts of colors. And in my looking at the whole collection, I never saw one duplicate. Everything was different. Everything had to be a little different, a little different size, a little different color. Um, it's one of the most difficult and complex. So for example, Steichen and Stiglitz that were in that exhibit were doing guns. They soon abandoned that process and of course went to the silver gel print, which a lot of the photographers did back then. Of course, they, that went into straight photography and we know the, the history behind that. Um, you need special papers because it needs to be absorbent because you've got to be able to have this saturate in. And um, for them, it, it lent itself to the painterly style that they loved. And uh, you'll see that in this one. Waiting, this is Waiting for the Ferryman. Um, she did about three versions of this, calling the ferryman, waiting for the ferryman. Um, this is the little Miami River right in front of their house. Um, everything was staged, everything was created. So the women standing here, all of the costumes were created. So this was like a elaborate stage production to put these photographs together. Same thing with the, you know, the man in the resting. They got the baskets, they made the hats. They had a whole Dutch series in which they made, James would make carved out wooden shoes, Dutch shoes to put in the, in the, into, the, uh, into the photographs. The other thing you see about this too is just, it looks like it's early morning, they're getting ready to maybe go to market. This print too is printed on both sides, so they didn't waste things. So on the other side is another image. We just have to choose this one. I want to tell you about his dark room. So this is, this is Margaret. Fathers always insisted that mother's names be on the pictures because she thought of all the ideas, she would have it all in her mind. Certain people remind her of characters and various stories she read. She had a real imagination. Um, that she did. And you know, they were voracious readers. Um, Dickens, um, the classics, uh, a lot of these story tells, and the Grimm Brothers, um, all, all, sorts of, all sorts of imagery found her way into her photographs. Um, so in James, when I went into the estate and went back to the dark room, there was no electricity to the dark room. 
So this is 1978 or so. So I was trying to remember, Jenny, do you remember if they had electricity in the 70s? To my recollection, I don't remember there was electricity when I went to the house. There may have been, but certainly um, through their entire career there was no electricity in the house and there was no plumbing in the house. And so the dark room was this stone building with a, a glass, um, like a window pane in the roof so the light would come through. And so you could only do work when there was enough light in the right time of day and the right temperature in there. So in the winter you couldn't do any dark room because it was too cold for the chemicals and such. So you look, I looked at this and I say, they made these kind of images in that kind of a crude circumstance. And I, it just blows me away to think about that. It was just amazing. And it, this was all James. Um, you know, like I said, Nancy, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go forward. The Colin the Fairman was done in 1907, the one we just saw. And um, it was in a, a, a photo era magazine in 1908 and got first place. This was in Boston. So back then, you would have competitions by the different um, pictorial magazines. Photo Air was one, Camera Work, Wilson's Photographic Magazine, um, Kodak would do that, different camera clubs would put on shows. So you had this going on all over the United States, and there was all these competitions. We'll, we'll speak back to the one that Nancy and, uh, competed with against Stiglitz and Steichen. Um, I love this one. Um, so, this is Nancy's quote. If it's a little bit difficult to see, it seems to me that somehow my pictures form, written in my mind. I seldom, perhaps never, start out with a camera with the idea that I might accidentally encounter some likely subjects. So this is, I think this is gorgeous. You also have to know that the, the candle light was manipulated, so the candle is a little big, right? The flame, and you can see the, the rays coming off that were all manipulated in the dark room to create that, um, that effect. So she probably had this woman sitting and just a little single light source coming forward. Um, again, very Rembrandt-esque. Uh, and uh, it's just very evocative. It just, it just tells a, a wonderful emotion. Um, a lot of Nancy's portraitures were done with a single light source. So, I think, where's, is this you, dear? No. Yes. I have some readers. I have readers. This is Nancy speaking. I am, in the first place, a homemaker and thoroughly interested in my housekeeping, and I am afraid hopelessly practical. If you were to come to my house, you would most likely find me cooking a meal or making another dress for my little girl. You know how fast those youngsters grow. However, if the con weather conditions are right, I'm liable to drop my work at any moment and with my camera, take to my usual haunts for picture taking. But I learned housekeeping long before I owned a camera. No, I've never had any art training other than a love of reading, of pictures, and of the beautiful God has given me. About 15 years ago, I came into possession of a 4x5 plate camera. My very first exposures were interiors and they turned out good. Then I took to making pictures of my friends and so drifted into studying the interesting characters in our village. From this time on, it became a series of adventures. I could scarcely wait from day to day to make new experiments with my camera. Thank you, Christina. Sigismund Blumen. <laughs> was um, in San Francisco. This is in Wilson's Photographic Magazine. He was an editor of Camera Craft. He was a photographer himself. He was a critic. He wrote a lot of articles, he wrote manuals. Um, and he and Nancy corresponded by letters quite a bit. And he wrote several articles on Nancy in different magazines, and this is one of them. I was particularly telling about how Nancy um, viewed her work. But she was uh, a mother and a housewife for uh, the blacksmith. 
So again, character study, single light source. Um, you might call that chiaroscuro, which is basically the play of light and dark to create the shadows, to create um, a softness to the image. Uh, again, this person, she would have dressed to look like a blacksmith. Uh, my wife and I were just a little bit ago in Lenox, Massachusetts. Anybody know who's in Lenox, Massachusetts? Norman Rockwell. And I thought, well, here's this little tiny town, and Norman lived there the whole time, basically. And all his characters and all the people he drew basically came from that little town. And it was just like Nancy and James. They were content to live in Loveland, Ohio, and they were content to work with the, the people that were in their neighborhood, their cousins, the family, the, whoever was downtown and they could pull in to have a photograph or thought they had the right image for that. So I, I was thinking that here, you know, it's, it's the same, same thing. And I'm sure this happened many, many times over in many different communities for photographers. You know, you love where you live, what's the reason to travel any distance? Um, so I, I really like that sense of using the locals. Um, nice guy, isn't he? Huh? So I'm waiting for, there you go. are photographic enthusiasts. The farm, we are inclined to think, is much like other good Ohio farms, but there happens to be an old, a very old stone house on it. Washington slept there once. In this lovely place is an equally ancient high chimney corner. The nearby town of Loveland is like thousands of other towns, with its old folks and its young, its natty and its ragged. Were they our neighbors, we might think them dull and commonplace. Comes Mrs. Cones with her magic box and lights them from within or incarnates them with her own poetry, and they are epic or lyric as a result. She puts a hundred verses, a whole book full of homey romance, into one little picture taken with an antique camera and an inexpensive lens. She prefers these to her better outfit, which gathers dust, or does it? in idleness on a closet shelf. What does she need from a clubroom full of advisors? What incentive? She rarely exhibits and seldom appeals or tries to appeal to the academic taste of salon committees whom God in his infinite mercy forgive. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I, I think Nancy just had a mind of her own, and she knew Nancy, she, she just knew exactly what she wanted, and she did it. Um, so Sigismund, again, uh, just interesting person. I have one of his photographs, which is really kind of cool. I, I, I was able to find one and collect it. He was also a correspondent for the New York Tribune. Uh, he did two shows in San Francisco of Nancy's. One was at the 1915 Pan um, Pacific Exposition, which was held in San Francisco. He arranged a private exhibit for her in the, in, the, in the salon there. And then also a year later, there was another exhibit that um, he hosted for her. So Nancy was out there several times. And both exhibits, so I think one had close to 30 photographs. The other one was maybe close to 50. So um, he, he really took care of her and um, helped her career also. Um, I, I found this right at the end. Uh, and I want to put this in because, again, another great character study. That's James. And um, this was in National Geographic magazine. I thought, well, that's really cool. Um, this is 1923 in November. The whole issue was on horses. And um, this one was in, the, in, in, the, in the, one of the pages. And so I just thought, again, you know, the sense that we got all this black background back here. And you're just highlighted by his face and the way he's caressing that horse's nose. Um, and James has such a great rugged look, don't, you know, you just want him to be a grandfather or something. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know anything else about that, I've never seen it in the estate. Could be that National Geographic bought it, and that happened sometimes, so they purchased it and you would not see it again. Uh, but my wife helped me research that and we went to the library to, to f sort out where we could get this thing. And it took us a little while, but we got it, so I thought that was pretty great. So the Sigismund said this in an article about Nancy, which 
I think it's pretty significant. Um, and this work poem probably stands foremost among Amer American pictorialists. Um, when we were looking at the estate, we found 54 competitions or shows that, that she had won awards in. When I looked through the names of some of the other contestants, once in a while I'd recognize a, a name that I'd seen before. Now, it doesn't mean she entered every show, and, um, but she often placed well. She earned a lot of money from that. Um, so I think he recognized her genius, and really the genius that James had, because Nancy could not have you know, realized this without James's work. And so uh, I, I always am uh, really proud of that statement that Sig has been made. This is Potato Harvesters. Is Miss Ryan of a Malay? Uh-huh. Yeah, a genre. Data workers. I think that's James one stooping over. I'm not positive about that. I love that image. It's one of my favorites. I, I love the source of light again that's coming through there and it's just like it's maybe at the end of dusk. Because that should be towards the road and the the house faced west. So um as I remember. So um you know, obviously they're harvesting it's the end of the harvest. So um this was taken in nineteen eleven. It was also shown in 1922 at the Cincinnati, um, the Camera Club of Cincinnati. Um, great image. So these are the words of Professor Daniel Cook, University of Cincinnati, Camera Craft Magazine, 1921. I have traveled a great deal and have seen many exhibitions of photographs in Europe and America, but I've yet to see anything that approached the artistic qualities of these prints. I have done a good deal of experimental work in photography, especially with reproductive methods, and I soon observed from the texture and the variety of tones that the prints that I had in hand were gum prints, but they were so far in advance of any gum print I had ever seen but they were in a class of their own. I did not delay long in getting acquainted with Mr. and Mrs. Cones of Loveland, Ohio. The secret of their success was the capacity for taking great pains. Yeah, I love that. Uh, and this is the guy who taught things, so he appreciated that. And uh, the other thing he, uh, that James did, he was so good that paper manufacturers would send him paper to work with and to, um, to, to use in the, in the techniques. He would get tissues, he would get all sorts of papers that were suitable for gums. That print over there is a platinum print, so you, let, you needed a different paper for a platinum print. I think in the estate there was three or 4,000 sheets of paper um, that were sent to James for him to work on and he'd make his notes and he'd send it back to the manufacturer and say this and this and this about this. So uh, James was recognized throughout the country for his technical prowess and um, that speaks to it also. Okay, Outer Wicket. We have that back there. The accompanying photograph won the grand prize. This is from the Marymount Chapel, taken in 1926 when they were here. That's James. Love the get up. <laughs> they made all that. Created that whole costume. I, I can't even imagine. They must have had a whole room of costumes upstairs. I, I never found the costumes, but I mean, hundreds of thousands of photographs, and they're all, all dressed in different ways. Um, so uh, I always thought that was maybe uh, Robin Hood or something. Knights um, of old, but uh, again, just again, the single light source. You know, creating the shadows and the darks and the lights. The composition is wonderful with the arch over his head. It's just a beautiful photograph. Uh, it's one of my favorite ones, too. Um, and uh, I believe this was taken in uh, yeah, 1926, I said that. Um, so I never did find out much about whether they stopped doing any business when they lived here. Uh, it would be an interesting question to find out. I should have maybe discovered more about that. Obviously, they lived here for a year. They had a farm to take care of. Margaret had to be schooled, and uh, they had a business. So maybe they were allowed to still work and do all that at the same time. Professor 
Professor Daniel Cook again. Mrs. Combs told me in a casual way that she had studied that picture for over a year, little Dutch girl. Nor is this unusual for some of her subjects have been studied for even a greater period of time. The little Dutch girl was posed at all hours of the day, from 5 a.m. until dusk. Nor was this all, for when the light effect was finally decided upon, Mrs. Cohn saw that by removing the door, she could improve the light. So the door was taken off its hinges. Mrs. Cohn's is always on the alert for new and interesting subjects, which she has a great faculty for discovering. Mr. Cohn's is more interested in producing artistic prints from the character studies which his wife is constantly making. They work hand in hand, each encouraging and criticizing the other without reserve. When I asked Mr. Cohn's how he had brought the gum process to such perfection, he answered in his characteristic, good-natured way. I had a good helper and a most severe critic who kept after me, insisting that we must have more definition and there's nothing for me to do until I got it. <laughs> okay, man, does that seem to ring a bell? <laughs> Keep getting it done. I, I love that. And I, you know, just from the pictures of James, doesn't he seem like just this, this wonderful, cuddly guy you just love to sit and talk to? And you could talk farming, you could talk literature, you could talk anything you wanted. And he would just do, you know, he would just go right along with you. I, I have all these small pictures that, in my collection that around the farm when he's doing working with the kids or making a pumpkin or they're, you know, feeding the chickens and he, he just looks like a, a fabulous guy to have known. I would have liked to have known him. Um, so Daniel Cook wrote several different articles on them also. Um, and uh, I assume he got to know them well over the years. Solace. So Solace was done in 1915. Um, this was exhibited in, at the California Camera Club in the Palace Hotel. Um, it was one of 55 in the image. This again was one that Sigismund Blumen had helped put together for them. The, the show was in 1960. This was done in 1915. There's a couple different names for this uh, I've come across. So at different times, the title will change. And when I was working with Margaret, and we were looking at the images, and we're trying to figure out, well, when was this done? And who are the people in here? And um, so we'd often find that, and what was the title? Because there wasn't things written on these things, for the most part, unless they were documented in a show or something. So um, this has had a couple different titles. But um, I, love, I love the, again, A.H. Beardley was a critic for um, Photo Era magazine. And this is not Aubrey Beardley, the artist. Uh, I wish it was, that would have been nice. But in 1927, my personal reaction is that this exceptional genre was made overseas in Germany or Switzerland. Yet, I may be entirely wrong. In any event, whoever made it and wherever it was made, this picture tells a story. I am uh, quite love it. She did a lot of photographs that had to do with World War I, you know, that was going on. Um, so some of these were about grief and about loss. And uh, there's some images that have to do with you know, letters sent home saying your, your husband's not coming back. And, sharing that with the children. So um, this is the same fireplace. Anybody recognize the fireplace from the first room? Um, just a different little angle. You have Mr. Macabre? Okay. Um, photography is disdainfully exclaimed a friend of mine, a celebrated colorist. Photography, it is just a bit of white with a bit of black. So quoted Henry Voisin, French critic, in Revue de Vral et Dubois. M Miss, Madame, Monsieur Voisin, I don't speak French, uh, continues, I regret that he was not with me when I visited the Royal Photographic Society in London and stood before Macabre of Nancy Ford Cones. He would have seen what an artistic temperament combined with an incredibly perfect technique can do for an art such as photography, which is wrongly supposed by many to be mechanical and impersonal. The presence of this masterpiece, one hardly knows which to admire most, the physiognomy and pose of the subject, 
whose very attitude suggests the whole of the character which Dickens created, or the skill of the operator who has achieved such a triumph in chiaroscuro. I have never seen any by Nancy Ford Cones who showed such a feeling for values or who manipulated light and shade with such marvelous success. Elizabeth K. White, Art and Photography, Cincinnati Fine Arts Magazine, February 1929. Thank you, Christina. So this was shown in 1927 at the 72nd Annual Exhibition of the Royal Photographic Society in London. Um, and this is a Dickens character from David Copperfield. And uh, this, the Voisson was a French uh, critic, so his quote was taken from a magazine he had written in in France. Um, and uh, so I want to read to you who Mr. Macabre is, because it kind of speaks to this image. He was a clerk in the 1850s novel who was identified with, and I quote, an optimistic belief that something will turn up. <laughs> He lives in hopeful expectation. So, this is my favorite Nancy Foreman Cohen's photograph. Um, I think this is an exceptional photograph, as uh, Mr. Boisson also thought. So, you know, it, you see these the, the, some of the themes, the allegorical studies, fairy tales, um, we'll get more of that to the dryad, um, Dutch studies, war studies, children's games, Hide and seek, um, um, the old lady and the witch, and uh, some of the other uh, Hansel and Gretel. I've got a photograph of Hansel and Gretel. So just she just let her imagination go, and then she'd have to create all the costumes, and then she'd have to get the subjects, and then she would pose them. It may take her days to do that. And she'd think through this: How am I going to do this? And what So this was like a little play. Each one was a little play, and um, this is the town grocer. So he was recruited, I don't know how many takes it took to do this. I've only seen one image of this. I haven't seen any varieties of this. So, um, and again, you see James's signature. He wasn't also the blacksmith, was he? You know, I, he wasn't, because I've looked at the image a couple of times. It was very similar, though, wasn't it? I, I, um, I had to look around. I, I, have, I know some of the other characters and some of the other photographs, but they just weren't in the show, and I didn't have them all to be able to put in. But I really like this one. Oh, I think it's just a wonderful, I just love the highlight of the light on the collar, his face, just the way the hands are positioned, you know, one's got a glove, one doesn't, um, just the cock of the hat. It was, I mean, to, to, you think about what you have to do to create that image, to have it come off that way, and it's just spectacular. Yes, please. I am asked to answer the question, why am I a pictorial photographer? And I ask myself, why am I? I do not know that I am one. I believe that I've just gone on for years, breaking all the rules of photography and making pictures as I pleased, and that others have decided for me whether or not I am a pictorialist. Of course, she called herself a pictorialist in her advertisement in 1902. Um, I don't think she liked labels. I'm sure James didn't either. You know, they, they were... They were doting on their little daughter Margaret, and of course Margaret was in about every other photograph they took. And uh, so, you know, photography, as this went on, this is 1930, it moved well past pictorialism for the most part. The journals were still being done, so photo air camera works were still being produced. But, you know, the contemporary photography had moved a bit away from all this. Um, sugar making. This is one of my other very favorite ones. Maybe it's because I own it, I don't know. Um, so it's a hand-colored photograph. So let me tell you about the hand-coloring. And, and Joe just came up to me a few minutes ago, and he has a variation on this uh, that's not, not hand-colored. But um, so you have to think about this. They had no electricity. And so basically all the hand-coloring of all the images were done in the winter when they had a fire going in the fireplace. And they would sit next to the fire, and they would bring out their watercolors or whatever they were going to use, and they would work on the images that they were going to color. So they did tissues. Now, if you're coloring a tissue, you're doing it from the back side, and the color will show through. This is a, uh, probably a, I'm not sure whether it's a silver pen. I always thought it was a platinum, maybe, that they hand colored. I think it's exquisite hand coloring. Um, 
And um, this is of uh, the two Ertl brothers that were just family friends, and I am sure they had a sugar making operation somewhere in the hills, and they went up and photographed them. Now, obviously, this is winter because the maple syrup, maple uh, syrup has to be running, and uh, then they would have gone back and hand colored that. So certain things were done at certain times. Obviously, it got busy with harvest time and planting time, and you know things would take a break. Doesn't mean Nancy wouldn't go out, but it means that she may take some images and they don't get developed right away. Um, so, uh, this was done about 1920, so one of my favorites. These are the words of Owen Finson, since I inquire, November 1980. If, like Steichen and Stiglitz, the Cones had moved to New York, they would have become famous before now. They preferred to live in Loveland. Nancy wrote, I have not traveled to far places for my subjects. I've not photographed many famous people. It has been my fortune to bring life to the remote and the obscure. Perhaps it is the quiet life I have lived. I do not say uneventful, for I am sure that when, where I am working with the subject that interests me, the air is electrified, for me at least. Owen Fenson was the writer for the Cincinnati Enquirer for decades. Um, he was also a friend of Walt's, and he, he did a nice article on Nancy um, some time ago. Um, so again, going harking back to Rockwell and other artists that just worked in their own little area. I, I think Nancy would have maybe evolved in a different direction, but she really didn't have a desire to do that. And you know, all these images you see, like macabre, um, the dryads especially, all these other images, they were never sold. She just took them and kept them. Now some of them were submitted to salons and for competitions, but it wasn't like she had a shop down in Loveland and she was selling these images of, of Mr. McCobber or some other thing. That, that was just their own personal joy in doing that. And I think that's just amazing. Now she did make money when she competed in, in maybe a Kodak contest or something like that. But I don't think that was the reason. In fact, Nancy, James submitted the first photograph to a contest. Nancy didn't even know about it. And of course, she won. And so it just, uh, it, it, she, that wasn't her interest. She just wanted to make pictures. The beauty of making pictures and composition. So uh, a little bit like a, a playwright, creating a play. Threading the Needle was the one that won the competition where she got second place in 1905, New York City. There were 21,000 entrants. <laughs> there were 3,300 accepted to be judged. She was second. And that was in class A, so that was in the top class. There were different classes and different things. So yes, Edward Steichen, a little bit down the way in that same class was Annie Brigman. I don't know if anybody's heard of Annie Brigman, but she's a famous photographer too in her own right, and she competed against Nancy. Um, Nancy was in a, a, a show um, with uh, Richard Casebeer, who's another uh, heavyweight of the early photography years. So there was a lot of good company competing against Nancy. And uh, I think this image is, again, wonderful. Um, this is a copy of it. I don't. I don't know where the original image is. It may have gotten sold somewhere along the road. But I happened to have a copy, which was nice. And um, again, you know, the same type of, uh, almost a single source of light, and just the grandmother doting with the little daughter. It's a great image. It was also um, in a couple other uh, photo contests that she had um, done. Everybody's got this. You don't have that. I do. Oh. It seems to me that somehow my pictures form written in my mind. I seldom, perhaps never, start out with a camera with the idea that I might accidentally encounter some likely subjects. So what I thought about when this came up was the dryad. Because this is certainly not something you would expect to, to see. Um, some of the stories were that people in the, her camera club gave her a lot of grief over these, that locals in the area would come down and wag their 
finger at her and say, this is not what a proper young lady should be doing. And I think even one of them had to do with when the girls were waiting and they were just showing a little too much ankle or calf. Um, and of course, Nancy, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, she's doing these dryads in the 1920s. And not that other people weren't. Uh, Annie Brigman did some, Richard Case Beer did. So there are other people in the country doing this, but for a little local town like Loveland, to be taking these kind of images. So a dryad, in Greek mythology, a dryad is a nymph or a tree spirit of a forest, usually an oak tree spirit. So she didn't have oak trees down there on the river, but we had lots of sycamores. So most all of them were taken in a sycamore tree. And there are groups of three women. There are scenes in which there are river scenes in which they're dancing, cavorting in the river, just all young ladies in diaphanous type of gowns with you know breasts showing and you know, and uh, this is Margaret. And uh, I'm guess I, I tried to guess the age because Margaret was born in 1905. She looks to me it's like she's a in senior in high school, or maybe she waited till Margaret was in college before she did these photographs. So I just kind of figured 1922 or something like that uh, when they did these. There's different time frames given for these dryads, and there's different versions of these. And some of these are like this with the trees, and others are just. They're swimming and out in the, in the Little Miami River. This was exhibited in 1932, so um, at the Fine Arts Gallery at the Second International Salon of Photography in San Diego. So it did get exhibited. Now, not this specific one, but a dryad. Um, the negative must possess a picture. And the main thing is the picture itself. After manipulation and printing processes alone cannot make a picture. To me, the password into the realm of picture making is the love of the beautiful and the faculty or indefinable something that tells one what is essential and most of all what is non-essential in making a picture and without which faculty there is no art. Thank you. That was my last quote. I thought that was a beautiful summation of, of how she looked at her work. Um, James died in 1939 in the field. He was 78 years old. Margaret died in 1962. She was 92 years old. When James died, there were no more photographs done. Margaret went on to college and got her master's in piano at the College Conservatory in Cincinnati. She taught, and she supported her mother the rest of her life. Um, the photographs never moved. Nothing was ever done with them. They just stayed in that home all those years. It gives me good response to think about that. Um, Margaret passed away. I'm not sure. When I met her, she was 75. And uh, I, don't, I don't think she was around too much longer. but. Um, she just lived in the house though, all by herself. But she had piano, people would come in. She had a, grand, a big grand piano in the front parlor and she would give lessons. I think she also taught at UC. Uh, but, um, and she supported Nancy. And I, I don't know what that was like for Nancy, to, you know, to lose two loves, you know, your husband and your photography. Um, I really can't imagine that. I, she had her daughter and um, I, I guess that sustained her. So, um, I want to thank some people. I want to thank Lynn Long, especially, uh, for being my cohort and doing all this, Lynn. I want to thank Chris Harding in the back. Yeah, yeah. Chris helped me do the slide. I am not a Democrat. I want to thank my wife, Christina and Lynn, again for narrating. I thought it would give me a break. Uh, just a perfect voice. Um, also, Jenny Shives back here has been one of my constant companions in this. Jenny also did her master's thesis on Nancy Ford Collins. So Jenny's in that one. And John Butler from the Loveland Museum, um, which is the stronghold of Nancy Ford Collins. Um, I want to thank you, Joe, for working with me. I, I would certainly like to ask you know, ask me some questions. We can go back and look at a slide if you'd like to. Um, I'm here to do whatever it is. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, come on. Was that that?
Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm wondering how do the photographs hold up from the 20s? Are they wonderful? Oh, okay. You know, it, <clears throat> so the one that was um, the one that was calling the ferryman that was printed on two sides. You know, oftentimes they would just they're just James was just experimenting. He, he would do one side, and then oh, maybe he didn't like that very well, and he'd just turn over and print on the other side. So there were a lot of images that weren't in the best of shape, um, because there was just lots of images. I think there was 3,000 or more images in the, the state. There was thousands of glass slides. I mean, 15,000? I can't quite remember what it was. It was just a huge amount. And a lot of those were not in good shape, because they'd just been put in boxes, and some were out in the stone house, and some were in the bedroom. So they were just all over the place. But by and large, there was a great body that were in the Yes, good question, thank you. Yes, Bobby. Um, this is, I'm asking this question because I'm absolutely stupid about the dark There seems to be an overall darkness to the photograph. Is this a preference from the times? Is it because that's all they can do? No. The rain? Or was it personal choice? That was her personal choice. I think especially when it came to portraiture, she liked the drama of having the light on the face and having the, the, the contrast, the high contrast between the white and the dark. Um, you know, this, this photograph over here, uh, that's Nancy with Margaret when she was born. So that's 1905, that, that uh, platinum print. Um, you know, again, you've got the spotlight effect. And she just really liked that. And then you look at other things like, you know, they're playing um, Brian Men's Bluff or whatever game it is over there, and that's just a well lit. Um, part of this was the nature of gum prints. They didn't, they, they, they had a, a darkness to them. Um, and there's a few around here that have a little more light. The print back there that's of a stage scene, that, she did the illustrations for a book. The book is right over there. It's the black book that's on the top shelf. And of course you can see that those are well lit. I mean, it's easy to see that. There's no darkness in that. That was, I think there was five or six Photographs that's on tissue uh, that were done for that book over there. That was a French book. I'll tell you the name of it, but I can't pronounce it. Um, but by and large, I think that was similar for the time, too. Tina? Did they, so, did they develop the plates right away and then print them later? Yeah, she used cheap glass. You know, I, I think Daniel Cook was one of the, it might have been Sigmund Bloom. They were just referring to the fact that she was not using the highest tech things available as far as cameras. They were just using, I mean, obviously they didn't have a lot of money. I mean, they were, they were just using basic materials, but yeah, um, they were they, using. But how did they, like, when and how did they develop the plates with the, the, the chemical agents in the plate? That's a good question. I don't know. Okay. Now, oh, I'm sorry, young lady. Okay. <laughs> you said that she earned some prize money, but I'm assuming that was not enough to the they had the farm. Uh -huh. They had portraiture, kids and adults and, and all that. They had photo contests that they would enter. They had Kodak. So they would sell images to Kodak to use in their advertising campaign. And I think that only lasted maybe 14 years or 16 years where they did that with relationship with Kodak. And I think then Kodak went in a different direction. But she still submitted things for first for contests, you know, further up. But the, the heyday of the contests were probably the, the 1910s and through the 20s and that kind of petered out. So by and large, the farm had an income to it and the portraiture. Yes? How did the Marymount Company use her photographs she took while she was living there? That's a good question. Joe, did you hear that question? How does Marymount use her photographs? Well, at the time, 1926, um, Marymount had been in existence for three years and a lot of high hopes for it. But unfortunately, they wanted to sell lots in addition to the rentals. They didn't have any trouble, I think, with getting people to go into the rental units. But they wanted to sell lots, people to build homes. And uh, so the Marymount Company knew about this famous photographer living next door in Loveland, and so they thought, well, why not hire her to promote Marymount? So they gave her a house at the corner of uh, Oak and Elm, and um, she lived there for a year, 
and she took a lot of photographs and they were used in, in the, um, in the sale, sales brochures and other things just to create this image, or not just create, but to show the image of Marymount, what a charming place it was to live. So that was her main role in Marymount. And, uh, she, she was in her 50s at that time, mid-50s, and actually she, her fame had been a little earlier, uh, in her, maybe in her 30s. So she had wasn't she wasn't in the prime of her career at that time. Maybe she was kind of winding down. But we have a few in the show from there, from her 1926 time here. Um, and I think it did help, you know, sell homes and make Mary Mount more famous. And here we are still talking about her 90 years later. So, but she did preserve a certain time for us and the Preservation Foundation, that's very important. And uh, so we're grateful for that. Um, the Preservation Foundation has a collection uh, of her works that relate to Mary Mott. We got them at the same time that Wren got his and Lynn uh, Weekly got his from the Walt Burton Gallery when they were going out of business and uh, Preservation Foundation got a good price on them because uh, she had been quite expensive for that. We got them about 87 and uh, I was talking to a collector here, the Hirschhorns, and uh, they were telling me they bought some stuff in 1981 and the prices were quite a bit higher. But she certainly um, preserved a slice of time for us and we're really grateful for that. And this reminds me if anybody saw that recent movie that was played here at the barn and also in general release a few years ago uh, about uh, Vivian Myers mm -hmm. who was kind of an unknown woman photographer and uh, she was less well known than Nancy Ford Collins because in her day Nancy Ford Collins was quite well known. She photographed a lot of celebrities in Cincinnati, uh, movers and makers, and got a pretty good price for her portraits. But Vivian Meyer is more of a street photographer, and uh, she lived in Chicago in the 60s and 70s, and when she died, uh, somebody who just bought a, a lot of stuff unknown, there are tens of thousands of images. <coughs> Of her work, and there was a movie about her called Finding Vivian Myers. And the first photo focus show, I think four years ago, had a, an exhibit of hers. And so, I've, the question is today, people using digital, when they when they pass, what's going to happen to their stuff? And as before, Cones had negatives and prints, Vivian Myers had negatives and prints. Now, there's just stuff on hard disk and whatnot. And, that will probably disappear. Thanks. Uh, there's a, back there, there's a dryad a plate, which goes with that photograph. So if you wanted to know what a plate looked like, there's one right back there in the top. Any other questions? Yeah, Joe. Is there interest in her other places than in the Cincinnati area? Well, you know, part of my goal is to get Nancy more recognized. I believe she's a significant photographer and partnering with her husband. So my goal is there's never really, I mean, you know, Jenny and I have talked about this. There needs to be some more serious study done and a more uh, academic type of approach to her. I really think she deserves more. And this is kind of like with Vivian Mary, you know, you, you find somebody who's just kind of been forgotten. And I think, I feel this show to some degree is another rediscovery of Nancy. I mean, she's out there, you know, Loveland has it, we have it in, our, in collections, but we're not talking about it, and we need to talk about it more, and I feel that's part of the wonderful thing about Photo Focus, is that we're highlighting people who deserve to be highlighted and maybe have gotten neglected along the way. So I'm, that's why I'm hoping, and I'm working towards that goal, at that end. Yes? Yeah, I know, it's just amazing. Uh, 
and how she, you know, creates a different light on the cloth here and around the hands. The same thing with macabre, you know, on the, on the, on the collar. I, you know, none of that's by accident. <laughs> you know, that's somebody who really knows their craft and does it well. And again, you're using it, you're working in a difficult medium. You're working in a stone, dark room, you know, with no electricity. You just, of course, you know, that's what you did back then. There wasn't electricity, but, you know, they could have had it done. Anyway, yes, any other questions? I could wax on that one. No? Thank you. Thank you.